Okay, so for this lecture, we're going to focus on the English colonization, the English colonies that uh, formed what became the United States. Now, of course, the English are not the only European power that is colonizing at this time. Uh, the Spanish, the French are as well, uh, the Dutch, and even a small Swedish colony, which we'll talk about. And at the end of this lecture, you will be able to find uh, a timeline of all the events that took place from the earliest European colonization of what is now the United States all the way to 1739. So, when you look at reasons that uh, the reasons for migration to North America uh, to the English colonies, there's a couple of reasons that stand out at this time in English history. First of all, you had massive overcrowding in cities like London. Uh, there were simply too many people. And it was men like Richard Hacklute who suggested removing what he called this human garbage. <laughs> he actually called the working poor of London human garbage in so many terms, in so many words. Uh, suggested removing them to the colonies in North America. And, of course, in addition to overcrowding, inability to find work, etc., you also had a great deal of English political turmoil during this time period. And so part of this lecture is also going to be talking about English history because all of these events are going to have ripple effects in the colonies. That is, as you have events occur in England, the after effects are going to ripple out into the colonies. After the death of Queen Elizabeth I in 1603, her cousin, uh, James, King of Scotland, came to the throne as James I, King of England. And King James I was the first of the House of Stuart to rule on the English throne. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I had been the last of the Tudor monarchs. And it was, of course, during the reign of King James I that the first permanent English colony in North America was founded at Jamestown in 1607. And James I ruled on the English throne from 1603 until his death in 1625. Another, another of the notable occurrences during his reign was the translation of the Bible into English for the first time, hence the King James version of the Bible. And after his death, his son, became King Charles I in 1625. But when Charles I ascended to the English throne, he married a French princess named Henrietta Maria, a Catholic. And this marriage to a Catholic brought him under increasing scrutiny by English Protestants and by the Church of England. Ultimately, Charles dissolved Parliament uh, and tried to rule without them. He ultimately brought them back into session but then refused to call a parliament for 11 years between 1629 and 1640, what is known as the 11 years tyranny. Ultimately, though, Charles found that he could not fund England, could not uh, raise enough money to rule England without parliament. And so uh, he tried to call parliament back into session. This, of course, set off a series of clashes and a series of, of three wars that collectively we know is the English Civil War from 1642 to 1651. And in the English Civil War, you had two sides, the Cavaliers who sided with the King, adherents of the monarchy, and the Roundheads. And the Roundheads, of course, known for their bowl haircuts, were followers of a Puritan named Oliver Cromwell, a member of Parliament, and they were fighting for the supremacy of Parliament. Ultimately, of course, the Roundheads and Cromwell won the English Civil War. Uh, Charles I was tried for treason, convicted, and beheaded on January 30th, 1649. And after that, Oliver Cromwell served as Lord Protector of England, not King, but Lord Protector from 1649 until his death in 1658. After that, they tried to have Cromwell's son succeed him as protector, but it was not very popular. And so they made the decision to bring back the sons of Charles I to the English throne in what was called the Restoration. The restoration of the Stuart monarchs to the throne 
beginning in 1660, 1661. And on the right, you can see King Charles I. And on the lower right, you can see Oliver Cromwell. The first of the Restoration Kings was King Charles II, who ruled England from 1660 until his death in 1685. And then you had his brother, the Duke of York, who became King James II. And well, the problem, of course, with King James II is that he was Catholic. And uh, because of this, a number of English Protestants fled England, fearing persecution. Including those who fled was the daughter of James II, Mary, and her husband, William, the Duke of Orange. And the Church of England and others were willing to let James II, let, willing to let his reign play out because he had no children. And so the Catholic monarchy would die with him. But all that changed three years into his reign in 1688 when the Queen gave birth to a son, which raised the specter of a long line of Catholic monarchs on the English throne. At that point, the Church of England and others invited William and Mary to raise an army and land on the coast of England. And they did so in 1688. Uh, there was some fighting, but James II quickly realized that the odds were against him and he abdicated the throne. At that point, William became King William III of England and ruled from 1688 until his death in 1702. But there was a problem. The dominant political theory at that time was the theory of the divine right of kings. This idea that these English monarchs were descended from Adam, the first man, and therefore had a God-given right to rule over others. The problem is that if that theory is correct, that means that the son of James II should have become the next king of England. William and Mary had interrupted that succession. So how do you justify that? One of the men who came back to England with William and Mary was named John Locke. He was an English philosopher and writer. And Locke took this opportunity to write down his views on government. And in 1690, he published a book called Two Treatises of Government. And we're going to talk about the political ideas of John Locke because they greatly influenced the founding generation of the United States. And on the left, upper left, you can see King William III and his wife, Queen Mary II. And on the lower left, you can see John Locke. In his first treatise of government, John Locke went through and destroyed the idea of the divine right of kings. He showed through logic and history how it was impossible that any of these English monarchs would be descended from the first man, from Adam, and even if it was possible, they did not have a God-given right to rule over anyone else. And so... Then, in the second treatise of government, Locke laid down his positive ideas for what he believed a legitimate government should be. And so Locke starts out with the premise that if no man is born to rule over any other, that all men must be equal, at least in terms of their political rights, must be born equal. But that led Locke to another problem, the problem of the state of nature. Locke reasoned that in the beginning, if no one was born to rule over anyone else, if everyone is equal, that would create a very chaotic situation that he termed the state of nature. I think for some people, the state of nature has been regarded as a thought experiment, but I think for John Locke, it may actually have been a real place. Uh, now, we know from disciplines like anthropology and history that human beings naturally tend to organize themselves very quickly into hierarchies, but Locke reasoned that if everyone is equal, then you would have a very chaotic place, the state of nature. And in the words of another social contract theorist, Thomas Hobbes, life in the state of nature must of necessity be nasty, brutish, and short. Essentially, you have a situation like Lord of the Flies, where everyone is just out after everyone else, where there's no overarching authority. 
And Locke says, okay, well, how do we escape this state of nature? Well, people have to form a social contract with each other in which they form a government to rule over each other. And in that social contract, everyone gives up some of their God-given rights uh, to a government in order to protect three key things, according to John Locke. The things the government should protect are life, liberty, and property. Locke reasoned that the right to life must come first if no one has a right to rule over anyone else. And what best to preserve that life than the right to political liberty? And then what best to preserve that political liberty? And here Locke is thinking about a community of small farmers. Uh, what best to preserve that liberty would be the right to own private property that you could sustain yourself with. Now, Locke went on to reason that if a government stops protecting these fundamental rights of life, liberty, and property, that it is the right of the people to rise up and throw off that government uh, by force if necessary and institute a new government that suits them better. Locke called this the right of revolution. And you can see how this would justify uh, the glorious revolution in the eyes of the English and anyone else who read and believed Locke's theories. Um, the people of England rose up and threw off the Catholic monarch, King James II, and replaced him with King William III. And you can also see the impact that Locke had on men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and others who helped to found the United States. I mean, the Declaration of Independence is practically plagiarized from John Locke. And so these ideas about, these Lockean ideas about a state of nature, social contract, and the rights to life, liberty, and property are deeply ingrained in the founding documents of the United States from the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution. Now, while all of this political turmoil is occurring in England, you have the settlement of the 13 original colonies that became the United States. And you have four, generally speaking, four regions of settlement. And these regions are separated out because the colonies in each individual region developed very similarly to each other, but very differently from the colonies in the other regions. The first region, of course, is the Chesapeake region. You have two colonies there, Virginia and Maryland. The second was New England, where you have the Plymouth Plantation Settlement, followed by Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. And ultimately, of course, Plymouth Plantation and Massachusetts Bay would fuse into one colony. Then you have the middle colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And finally, the southern colonies, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And so these are the four areas of settlement we're going to be talking about in this lecture uh, to look at how they developed and how they were how different from each other. After the failure of the Roanoke colony, the English monarchy lost any interest in backing colonial ventures for quite some time. But in London, joint stock companies rose up, and joint stock companies are exactly what they sound like. You could purchase stock if you're a wealthy individual in the company and eventually expect a return on your investment. The largest of these joint stock companies was the London Company. And finally, in late 1606, the London Company received a royal charter from King James I to settle a colony in Virginia called, well, they would, they would call it Jamestown. So in December of 1606, three small ships set out, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery, with 104 men and boys aboard to found this new colony. They sailed up the river that they named in honor of King James, the James River, and they founded what they called Jamestown, James City, on May 14th, 1607. Of course, this is Jamestown. But from the very beginning, things went very poorly. The location of Jamestown is uh, not an ideal location. 
It's on a marshy peninsula that juts out into the James River. And so there are uh, lots of uh, issues there, um, salt in the drinking water, yellow fever, and other diseases. And so from the very beginning, colonists began dropping like flies. Only a constant influx of new colonists from London allowed the colony to even stay alive. And then you had labor practices. Generally speaking, there were three types of men who settled early Jamestown. You had uh, wealthy stockholders of the London Company, and they were not accustomed to doing manual labor. Certainly, they were not going to start now. Secondly, you had adventurers like John Smith. They were interested in exploring, fighting with Native Americans, looking for gold, but manual labor... Yeah, not so much. The third group of men, and this became roughly 80% of the original settlers of Jamestown, were indentured servants. These were the working poor of London who could not afford to pay their own way across the Atlantic. And so in exchange for selling their services to a wealthy patron for a term of indenture, they came to the colony. Of course, they're the only ones doing manual labor. If you were over 15 years of age when you signed the term of indenture, typically the term was five years. If you were under 15 years of age, typically the term of indenture was seven years. And, of course, if you survived long enough to serve out your term of indenture, you were free to do what you wanted to do. Uh, but, nevertheless, this is what, where the main population of early Virginia came from was these indentured servants. Now, this is not the same as slavery. They were sometimes treated poorly and sometimes traded. Uh, their contracts were traded or lost in card games, things like that, but they were not treated the same as those that were enslaved. Treated badly, yes, but at least there was a contract at the end of which they would be free. The history of early Jamestown was a disaster. Uh, the Poetan Confederacy, this was their tribal land that the English had settled on, and they attacked Jamestown almost immediately in May of 1607 and killed off a number of the colonists. Captain John Smith, one of these explorers that I had talked about, was on an expedition up the Rappahannock when he was captured in December of 1607 by the Poetans. And Captain John Smith... For a long time, historians doubted a lot of what he wrote about Jamestown because his claims were so fantastic and he was known to have fabricated a great deal else that he had written about his other adventures elsewhere in the world. But the more that historians have learned about Jamestown, the more the conclusion has been that perhaps John Smith was in large part telling the truth about Jamestown. But one of the stories that Smith told early on was that he was only rescued from execution by the Poetans by the intervention of Pocahontas, the daughter of the chief of the tribe. Well, in 1607, uh, Pocahontas would have been 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old. Um, 12 years old. Does this seem like a likely story? Uh, don't know, but Smith has claimed that ever afterwards. Of course, Unlike the Disney version of the story, there was never any romantic entanglement between John Smith and Pocahontas, but nevertheless. Smith, though, did escape from the Poetans, and he was elected president of Jamestown on September 10, 1608, and he, he immediately laid down the edict, he that does not work does not eat, so everyone has to do their part, and gradually the colony begins to pull itself up and organize itself into a functioning society. Now, Smith was accidentally wounded by an explosion of gunpowder in October of 1609, and he returned to England. In his absence, the Poetans laid, fort, laid siege to the fort there at Jamestown, and that led to the starving time for the colonists in the winter of 1609-1610. Uh, there were a little over 300 colonists at the beginning of the winter, uh, but... Under siege by the Poetans, they got desperate. They began e eating uh, horses, rats. One young woman, a 14-year-old woman, probably an indentured servant, 
was eaten after she starved to death, so they did, in fact, resort to cannibalism. And we have confirmed that now. Uh, John Smith wrote about cannibalism at Jamestown, and until archaeologists found the body of this woman who has apparently was apparently eaten, uh, they didn't believe him. Meanwhile, of course, there were three separate wars between the Anglo colonists and the Poetans in Virginia. Uh, the first uh, starting in 1610, the last ending in 1646. By the end of the Third War, the, the Anglo Virginia colonists had crushed the Poetans. But economically, Jamestown was hemorrhaging money, and the stockholders of the London Company were not happy. That is until John Rolfe discovered that you could grow tobacco very easily there. John Rolfe was one of the early colonists. He was an avid smoker, and he had imported tobacco plants from the Caribbean. And he discovered that tobacco plants grow very well in the fertile soil around Jamestown, and uh, according to one observer, pretty soon every vacant lot, flower bed in Jamestown was planted with tobacco. Now, John Rolfe, of course, had the first tobacco plantation, and he exported the first tobacco back to England in 1612. And it turns out the English had a huge appetite for Virginia tobacco. It was a high-quality tobacco. And so economically, tobacco became the salvation of Jamestown. Meanwhile, still following the story of Pocahontas, she was actually captured in battle in April of 1613 during the First Anglo-Poetan War. She was forced to marry John Rolfe uh, at the age of 18 on April 5th, 1614. She converted to Christianity and took the name of Rebecca Rolfe. Then she actually did give birth to a son, um, while she was married to John Rolfe. Uh, she died, though, on a trip to England. She was there in England uh, on a trip with Rolfe uh, to raise money uh, for the colony of Virginia. And she took sick uh, when they were in the River Thames and died on March 17, 1617, at the age of 21. They put ashore and buried her there at Gravesend, England, where she rests to this day. So that is the end of the story of Pocahontas or Rebecca Rolfe um, from being captured and forced to marry an Englishman and then, of course, ultimately dying from an English fever of some kind. On the right, you can see Captain John Smith, the man who helped bring Jamestown out of chaos. And on the lower right, you can see a flowering tobacco plant, which became the economic salvation of the colony. On the left, you can see the skull of Jamestown Jane. That's what she's known as. We don't know what her name is. You can see the tool marks on her skull where the flesh was evidently scraped away when she was eaten. And on the left is a facial reconstruction of her, what she would have looked like based on the coloring of your typical Londoner from the time. Uh, and so this is how we have confirmation of cannibalism in Jamestown during the starving time. On the bottom right, this is a portrait of Rebecca Rolfe in London uh, shortly before her death at the age of 21. On the left is a statue of Pocahontas at the entrance to the cemetery where she is buried in England. And on the right is an artist's bird's eye depiction of early Jamestown. You can see the colony there on the peninsula jutting out into the James River. Uh, this was a good position for defense against attacks by the Poetans, but a very poor location when it came to things like uh, mosquitoes and salt in the drinking water. The year 1619 brought a lot of changes to Jamestown and a lot of firsts. One of the prominent colonists, Sir Edwin Sands, helped to organize the House of Burgesses, which was the first elected assembly in any of the English colonies in North America. And in August of 1619, a Dutch slave ship arrived on the coast of Virginia and with 20 and some odd enslaved Africans and these are, these are enslaved Africans that they had not been able to sell in the Caribbean, 
and so they stopped by Jamestown to see if the colonists there wanted to purchase them. The colonists at Jamestown did, in fact, purchase these enslaved Africans, but they signed them to indentured servants' contracts. And I say that to say that the way that slavery evolved in North America, especially after the Barbadian Slave Code of 1661, which we'll talk about, was not the way that it had to be and not the way that it has always been. Uh, these first Africans uh, worked off their contracts of indenture. They intermarried with other indentured servants, lived with other indentured servants. Some of those indentured servants, of course, were Englishmen. Some were Native Americans who had been enslaved and signed to contracts of indenture as well. But this is the first arrival of any enslaved Africans in any of the colonies that would become English colonies that would become part of the United States. Of course, you had enslaved Africans that arrived in the Spanish settlement of San Augustine as early as 1585. So these are not the first enslaved Africans to arrive in what would become the United States, but they're the first in any of the English colonies. Meanwhile, Jamestown has other serious problems. First of all, you have the mortality rate. The average life expectancy for men was 43 years old. For women, it was much shorter because women tended to die in childbirth. And then you have the dramatically skewed sex ratio. Uh, before 1700, the ratio of men to women in Jamestown was roughly six and a half to one. And so this guarantees that very little natural reproduction is occurring in Jamestown. 25% of all of the children born in early Jamestown died in infancy. Another 25% did not live to see their 20th birthdays. And so the, the colony is not reproducing and only a steady stream of new colonists from uh, London is even keeping the colony alive. In fact, at one point, they brought in an entire boatload of women from London uh, to be wives to some of these tobacco planters. So just not an ideal situation. Because of the profits coming out of Jamestown with Virginia Tobacco, King James I insisted on opening the books of the London Company in 1624. And it's then that he discovered what he called the scandalous situation where you had over 3,000 colonists that had died, only a little over 300 that were still alive. And James I used this excuse to dissolve the Virginia Company and make Virginia into a royal colony uh, ruled over by a royal governor in 1624. And so this ends the early history of Jamestown. The other Chesapeake colony became that of Maryland. And the idea of Maryland began with Sir George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore. Uh, Calvert was in, a member of the court of King James I. He was a close friend of the king. And in 1625, Calvert shocked many people when he came out and declared that he was, in fact, secretly a Catholic. And because of this, King James had to remove him from his court he had to publicly put distance between himself and his friend. And at that point, Calvert began thinking about settling a colony in North America that would serve as a safe haven for Catholics. Now, George Calvert died in 1632, but after his death, his son, Cecil Calvert, the second Lord Baltimore, carried on with his father's mission. And King Charles I granted him a royal colony. And... Of course, Cecil Calvert diplomatically named the colony Maryland after Queen Henrietta Maria, the Catholic wife of King Charles I. The first settlers arrived in Maryland aboard two ships called the Ark and the Dove in 1634. Maryland developed very similarly to Virginia, that is, they relied on tobacco and a constant inflow of indentured servants. And Maryland was a proprietary colony, that is, it was owned by the Calvert family. And in the colonial charter, Cecil Calvert made Catholicism the official state religion, although he did allow for Protestants to settle in Maryland. And 
Ironically, even though the Calverts had intended Maryland to be a safe haven for Catholics, most of the original settlers were in fact Protestants, and that led to constant conflicts, especially during the English Civil War, because, after all, it is the patron of Cecil Calvert, King Charles I, who is at war with other factions in England during the English Civil Wars. In fact, things got so bad that from 1644 to 1646, there was an era called the Plundering Time, in which the Protestants in Maryland went around looting and murdering their Catholic neighbors. After the beheading of King Charles I in 1649, Calvert realized he, should, he had to act quickly in order to save his colony from the new ruler of England, Oliver Cromwell, the Puritan, who hated Catholics, after all. Uh, we're going to talk more about Puritanism. And so, Calvert issued the Act Concerning Religion in 1649. This was the first act of religious tolerance in any of the North American English colonies. Uh, and it is not religious tolerance as we typically think of the concept in the United States today, but rather it was a statement that as long as you believed in the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ, you were okay. So in other words, Catholics and Protestants are okay, uh, really no one else. But nevertheless, it is the first statement of religious tolerance issued in any of the colonies. Cecil Calvert was allowed to keep his colony by Cromwell. He died in 1675, and at that point his son, Charles Calvert, the third Lord Baltimore, carried on with the the project of appointing governors for Maryland and you know governing Maryland. On the right you can see the second Lord Baltimore, Cecil Calvert. He of course named the city of Baltimore after his late father, the first Lord Baltimore. And on the lower right you can see the state flag of Maryland to this day. And this state flag is actually the coat of arms of Cecil Calvert, the second Lord Baltimore. The Maryland state flag is the only symbol of English nobility that still exists as a current symbol in any uh, part of the United States. So fascinating history to the Maryland state flag. The second main area of settlement was, of course, New England. Now, in order to understand the early colonization of New England, you have to understand the Puritans. Puritanism uh, was a uh, religious sect in England, and they were members of the Church of England, but they called themselves Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England of any and all Catholic practices. If you recall, when King Henry VIII created the Anglican Church, Henry VIII loved the Catholic Church. The only thing he didn't like is that he couldn't get divorced. And so he kept most of the trappings and pomp and circumstance of the Catholic Church. And Puritans are those who wanted to purify the Church of England and remove all traces of Catholicism from it. And when we talk about New England, we have certain myths about the Puritans who, who colonized New England. Um, I think the primary myth is that they were being religiously persecuted. They were not being religiously persecuted. They were perhaps a little uneasy about their status, but certainly not persecuted. And in fact, the first colony, uh, Plymouth Plantation, was settled by separatists. These are Puritans who believed that God had commanded them to come out and be separate from the rest of the world. And it began with the Scrooby congregation, north of London. They decided that their children were being corrupted by the decadent English culture. And so, as a congregation, they picked up, led by William Bradford, and moved to Holland in 1608. But they found that their children were growing up too much like the Dutch children around them, and so they decided to try to settle in North America. They decided to sail for North America in 1617, they did obtain a royal charter to settle in Virginia. After three years of scrimping and saving, they had enough money to purchase a small sailing vessel, the Mayflower, 
and they sailed for Virginia. They threw an error in navigation. They reached the coast of North America, far north of Virginia, and started sailing south. When they reached the area near Cape Cod, they were running dangerously low on supplies. And so they decided to put ashore there and found their colony there. On November 11, 1620, aboard ship, they signed the Mayflower Compact, which was essentially an agreement to found their colony together, to cooperate together and found their colony there. When they discovered that Cape Cod was not the mainland, they of course sailed around Cape Cod and landed at the site of an old Pawtuxet village. Now, between 1614 and 1616, there was a mass die-off event in this region. And this Pawtuxet tribe had been wiped out. We're not sure what killed them, it could have been a bubonic plague. Uh, any number of things could have killed them. But they put ashore uh, there at this old village. And that first winter of 1620, they almost died. Uh, they began digging into these earthen mounds that they found. And inside the earthen mounds, they found maize or corn. And so they began gathering up this maize and eating it and that's how they survived the first winter but they soon discovered that in fact these mounds with maize were graves they were the graves of the Pawtuxets who had died in this massive die-off two years earlier and William Bradford wrote that once they discovered that they were graves they stopped digging up the graves for the maize but in fact we know from other accounts that they did not stop they continued robbing these graves. Well, in the spring of 1621, a Native American man, a member of the Wampanoag Confederacy, uh, came out of the woods and greeted them in English. And he then sent for another man nearby uh, named Tisquantum, or as the uh, colonists called him, Squanto, who was fluent in English. And Bradford regarded Squanto being fluent in English as a miracle from God. But this was no miracle. It was a result of slavery. You see, Squanto was a member of the Pawtuxet tribe who had been uh, taken by an early English explorer back to England, and then he had been kidnapped by a second English explorer and sold into slavery in Spain. Now, he had escaped from Spain and returned to Massachusetts in 1619 only to find his village wiped out from this mass die-off event. And so Squanto returned fluent in English and Spanish, but certainly it was not miraculous, it was slavery. But uh, Tisquantum, Squanto, um, helped the Puritans, uh, taught them how to farm maize and of course arranged for the what is traditionally regarded as the first Thanksgiving feast between European colonists and Native Americans in the fall of 1621. Of course, we get a lot of these stories about uh, the early settlement of Plymouth Plantation, which is the settlement from William Bradford. He was the leader of the Scrooby congregation and he published the book of Plymouth Plantation in 1651. Of course, if the book was interesting for what it left in as much as for what it left out. Uh, for instance, Bradford did not talk about the Pequot Wars in which the Puritans helped to wipe out the Pequot tribe or the brisk trade in enslaved Native Americans that the Puritans had begun to uh, take part in as well. Um, Squanto uh, died of a high fever in 1622 while serving as a guide to Governor Bradford of Massachusetts. One thing I forgot to mention uh, from the previous slide is that the reason there was maize in the graves of the Pawtuxets is that that was a cultural uh, practice where they buried their dead with grain uh, that they could eat on their journey to the next life. So that explains that. Uh, 
On the upper left-hand slide, you can see an image, an artist depiction of the signing of the Mayflower Compact aboard ship on November 11, 1620. And on the bottom right, you can see an artist depiction of Tisquantum, of Squanto, the man who had been kidnapped into slavery, the English, the Spanish, and then ultimately lived to serve as translator to the Plymouth Plantation colonists uh, during the first Thanksgiving in 1621. The second New England colony to take shape was that of Massachusetts Bay. And again, for this colony, we have to go back to Puritanism and the Puritan leader John Winthrop. Now, John Winthrop was a Puritan leader in England and with the ascension of King Charles I to the throne, Winthrop and other Puritan leaders began feeling anxious about their position within England. Uh, Winthrop and other Puritan leaders gathered at Cambridge in 1629 and signed the Cambridge Agreement stating that they would be ready to sail for North America within one year's time. They did obtain a royal, they did sail for North America in March of 1630. They, ob they were unable to obtain a royal charter from the king at first because they were, in fact, Puritans, but they evidently tricked the king in their second application into thinking that they were just another joint stock company. And so the king granted them a royal charter to settle. You can see John Winthrop there on the upper left-hand corner of the slide. He served as the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And these are entire Puritan congregations that are picking up and moving across the Atlantic. Well, they moved across the Atlantic to do, in John Winthrop's words, to found what he called a city on a hill. A city on a hill to spread the light of Puritanism to the rest of the world. Uh, you'll sometimes hear American politicians invoke that phrase. Uh, they mean it in the context of America, an American democracy, a very different context, but nevertheless, that's where the phrase originates. Uh, Winthrop founded the city of Boston in September of 1630, and Massachusetts Bay was organized around the concept of congregationalism. And this is the idea that the local church, or the local congregation, is also doubles as the civil government. So Winthrop was the religious leader of the colony as well as the civil leader of the authority. It's a theocracy, a complete blending of church and state. And as a result of this arrangement, this congregationalism, anyone who was not a member of a local congregation was discriminated against in civil society and religious society. And of course, it also led to a lot of religious dissent. And uh, the Puritans were extremely rigid in their beliefs uh, and uh, in their public dealings. Uh, the great American writer H.L. Mencken once facetiously wrote that the great Puritan fear was that someone, somewhere, was having a good time. Uh, he may have overstated the case a bit, but not by much. On the lower left-hand side, you can see a map of early Puritan settlements in New England from Salem in the north down to Boston and Charlestown, down, all the way down to Plymouth Plantation. Eventually, of course, by the mid-1650s, Plymouth Plantation would get folded into the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The rigidity of the beliefs and practices of the Puritans guaranteed a great deal of religious dissent. And in fact, that religious dissent is how we see new colonies spin off from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Enter Roger Williams. Roger Williams uh, arrived in Massachusetts Bay at an early date, and he began preaching that the Puritans were not pure enough. Be because in his words, by even remaining nominal members of the Church of England, by not leaving the Church of England altogether, it was like, in his words, winking at the devil. Well, Williams became so divisive, ultimately there was a plot to murder him. He escaped in a thunderstorm one night to the south, and when the storm had passed, 
He helped to found a settlement which he named Providence, which became Providence, Rhode Island in 1636. And this is how the colony of Rhode Island was born. And Rhode Island became the place where religious dissidents who ended up disagreeing with the authorities in Massachusetts Bay ended up living was in Rhode Island. Another religious dissident was Anne Hutchison, although her problem was not theological. Theologically, she shared very few differences with the leaders of Massachusetts Bay. No, when she came to Massachusetts Bay and began preaching, the problem they had with her is that she was a woman. A woman taking the place of a man as a preacher in public. And so, in 1637, they charged her with the heresy of antinomianism. Now, the idea of antinomianism is that God speaks directly to you, as opposed to speaking to you through revealed scripture. This was a heresy in the eyes of the Puritans, and indeed, early antinomians in Boston, like early uh, Quakers, had been executed. But they put Anne Hutchison on trial for this heresy. And during the trial, the joke was on them. She knew the Bible better than they did. She talked circles around them. But despite acquitting herself well in the trial, they still convicted her of charges of antinomianism and expelled her from the colony. She initially, she, with her family, moved to Rhode Island. Later on, she moved north to a, a place near the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, which we'll talk about. She was killed there in a raid by Native Americans. And when she, when she was killed and John Winthrop learned of it, essentially his attitude was, well, good riddance. But Anne Hutchison is a good early American example of feminism. Certainly she would not have called herself that, but that's what she's doing taking the place of a man in society, unapologetically. Another early colonist, Massachusetts Bay, was Thomas Hooker. And Thomas Hooker took issue with the idea that unless you were a member of a local congregation, you could not vote. Hooker championed the cause of universal Christian suffrage. That is, if you professed Christ, you should be able to vote. And so Hooker went about helping to organize a new colony of Connecticut. Of course, this is after the Pequot Wars, after they had driven the Pequots out of the Connecticut River Valley. And Hooker helped to organize Connecticut in 1662. Uh, Connecticut's new governing document, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, which allowed for universal Christian suffrage, is regarded by many as the first democratic constitution uh, small d democratic constitution in the uh, English colonies. To the north of Massachusetts Bay, as settlers began moving to the north, you had increasing tension over competing land claims, and that is why New Hampshire broke off from Massachusetts Bay in 1679 and formed their own colony. But as you can see, this is how New England takes shape. As there are disagreements over either religion or land, uh, new colonies spin off from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but they all share this uh, fundamental Puritan heritage. The next region of English colonies were the Middle Colonies, and the Middle Colonies actually started out as a Dutch colony, and it was the Dutch explorer Henry Hudson who first sailed into what is now New York Harbor and up the river that now bears his name, the Hudson River. Uh, the colony of New Netherlands, though, was founded in 1624 uh, with a Dutch explorer, Peter Minuit. And according to legend, he purchased Manhattan Island from members of the Lenape tribe for $24 in beads. Now, that's a, a, a bit of a myth, to say the least. The $24 figure was... was uh, computed in the 1800s, and the Lenape were not selling him the island. Uh, they were in all probability selling them hunting rights on the island, but the Dutch took it as a bill of sale. So nevertheless, uh, 
The colony was overseen by the Dutch West India Company, which was a mercantilist firm. And the capital of the colony was the settlement of New Amsterdam on Manhattan Island. The colony stretched, though, all the way north to Fort Orange, where Albany, New York, is today. And uh, under Governor Peter Stavant, from 1647 to 1664, he was the governor. The colonists at New Amsterdam actually built an island, or uh, excuse me, built a wall uh, across the northern end of their settlement. That, uh, and of course the little dirt road that ran along that wall became known as Wall Street. Uh, also, when Stavant was governor, they held the first auction of enslaved Africans on Wall Street in 1655. Now, during the Restoration period, the Dutch and the English were in constant trade wars with each other. And that is why the English captain, Colonel Richard Nichols, approached uh, New Amsterdam with several warships in 1664 and forced the surrender of the city. And they also probably surrendered the city because of how unpopular Governor Stavant was. But nevertheless, they surrendered and the English took control of the colony. Now, of course, the king was King Charles II at that time, and it was popular for the king to award those men who had fought with his father in the English Civil War with land and titles. And so he gave the colony to his brother, the Duke of York, who would later become James II. And of course, the Duke of York renamed the New Netherlands New York and renamed New Amsterdam New York City. And of course, the English also acquired all the land south of what is now New York all the way down to Maryland. And so that is the history of early New York, uh, early uh, the New Netherlands. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, King Char Charles II. And on the bottom right, you can see his brother, King James II. And uh, by the time the English conquered New Amsterdam, it was already an extremely diverse city. And of course, New York has remained a, an extremely diverse city to this day. On the left, you can see an artist's depiction of the settlement of New Amsterdam in 1664. Uh, at the northern end of the settlement, you can see the wall and Wall Street. And at the very southern tip, you can see the fort that protected the city. And that is now the site of Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. Uh, on the right, you can see an artist's depiction of the first auction of enslaved Africans. Uh, in New Amsterdam in 1655. This is a map of the middle colonies as they looked in 1664. You can see the, the colony of the New Netherlands stretching from Manhattan Island all the way up the Hudson River to Fort Orange, which is now Albany, New York. Uh, the Dutch had also conquered the small colony of New Sweden which existed along the Delaware River between 1638 and 1655. The heart of that colony, of course, was Fort Christina, which is today Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, but this is all the territory that the English got uh, with, along with uh, New Amsterdam. And of course, one of the most notable elements about New Sweden is that a New Sweden is the first place that log cabins were introduced to North America by the Swedish settlers there. The next of the middle colonies was New Jersey. Now, after the Duke of York received the colony from his brother, he gave two of his close friends a colony that the king named New Jersey. Uh, of course, the, the, the men, Lord John Berkeley of Stratton and Sir George Carteret, had uh, remained close friends of the king throughout the English Civil War. And Charles II named the colony after the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel. It's an island that's near the coast of Normandy. It's also the birthplace of George, Catter of George Carteret. And... 
New Jersey was a proprietary colony. It was owned by Stratton and Carteret in the beginning. And the two proprietors issued a statement called the Concession and Agreement in 1664, which was a statement of religious tolerance because they were attempting to lure colonists to New Jersey. The Duke of York was also a stockholder in the Royal African Company. And so he actually encouraged settlers to bring enslaved Africans with them. They would receive more land for bringing enslaved Africans with them. So slavery extended into New Jersey as well. The proprietors wanted to attract colonists because they were got annual fees from these colonists that were called quit rents. And so they wanted to attract more colonists so they could collect more money from these quit rents. And they appointed Philip Carteret, a relative of George Carteret, to be the, the governor of the colony. But these quit rents were difficult to collect. And so Berkeley sold his share in the colony to a group of Quaker investors in 1674 that included William Penn. And at that point, they split New Jersey into East Jersey and West Jersey. And the colony remained split between East and West Jersey until Queen Anne made New Jersey into a royal colony in 1702. And at that point, she reunited East and West Jersey. Now, New Jersey, like New York and the other middle colonies, became home predominantly to small family farms. It was mostly how they made their livings is on small family farms. There were enslaved Africans in all of these colonies, but generally relatively low numbers of them. The next of the middle colonies was Pennsylvania. And in order to understand Pennsylvania, you have to understand a little bit about the Society of Friends. Uh, to outsiders, the Society of Friends are often called Quakers. Now, the Society of Friends was a religious movement that began uh, in England in the 1600s. Uh, George Fox is generally credited to, as the founder of the Society of Friends. And Fox preached uh, truth in inner experience and he put a great reliance on conscience as the basis of morality uh, they emphasized a direct experience of god rather than ritual and ceremony uh, they believe the quakers believe that rituals and ceremonies are an, un are an, an unnecessary obstruction between god and the believer uh, they preached about what George Fox called the inward light. So they believed in conscience. Uh, these are, in fact, antinomians. Early Quakers were persecuted badly. Even William Penn was imprisoned at one time for his religious beliefs. Uh, they were also, of course, executed in early Boston. William Penn was born into a wealthy family and at the age of 22, he converted to the Society of Friends in 1666. And because of debts that King Charles II owed to his father, Charles granted Penn a royal charter to found a colony in North America in 1681. Penn intended the colony to be a safe haven for Quakers and for religious freedom. And Charles II named the colony Pennsylvania, which from the Latin means Penn's Woods. William Penn was notable for the treaty he negotiated with the Lenape in 1682. His policy was to live in peace with the Native Americans. And of course, Penn also founded the city of Philadelphia that same year. Philadelphia, from the ancient Greek, means the city of brotherly love, uh, keeping with the Quaker tradition. However, uh, even the Quakers in Pennsylvania practiced African slavery. William Penn himself owned enslaved Africans, uh, although it was Quaker theologians 
before the American Revolution who were the first abolitionist theologians in the United States. So ultimately, abolitionism did come out of Quakerism. In 1701, William Penn helped the colony write their governing document, the Charter of Privileges, which uh, remained their governing document all the way till the time of the American Revolution. But after that, in 1701, Penn did return to England due to uh, religious and family difficulties that he had. And in this Charter of Privileges, the three lower counties of Pennsylvania that had been the colony of New Sweden asked for their independence. And Penn gave it to them. They became the colony of Delaware, Delaware uh, that was once New Sweden. You can see here a Quaker Synod on the upper right uh, hand side of your screen. And this is an image of William Penn. Uh, they were called Quakers to outsiders because of their belief in experiencing God personally or the Holy Spirit personally and the belief that when they did have these experiences, they would quake and shake in the sight of the Holy Spirit. The beginning of the southern colonies really begins with the English sugar plantations on the island of Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, the English had begun to colonize Barbados as early as 1627, and they soon turned it into a massive series of sugar plantations worked by enslaved Africans. Uh, very profitable. And in 1661 on Barbados, they ad the, these plantation owners adopted the Barbadian Slave Code. Uh, this slave code, for the first time, brought together all three elements of what we now know as slavery as it existed in the antebellum United States. That is the matrilineal principle, the idea that your status as either slave or free is the same as that of your mother. The race principle, that is, it's only uh, Africans or members of the African diaspora who can be enslaved. Uh, and finally, the chattel principle, in that enslaved Africans and African Americans were not people, but simply person, personal movable pieces of property chattel. So all three of these elements were brought together in the Barbadian Slave Code of 1661 for the first time. But the wealthy sugar planters on Barbados wanted more. They wanted to, to give to their children land and titles, but Barbados is a relatively small island. They're out of room. And so eight wealthy men, Englishmen, known as the Lord Proprietors of Carolina, the eight Lord Proprietors, approached King Charles II about granting them a royal colony in North America. Uh, Charles II in 1663 did grant them a royal colony. Uh, and in 1670, the first of the settlers established the, the uh, city of Charlestown on, the, on a peninsula between the Ashley and Cooper rivers. Of course, this is today Charleston. South Carolina. And South Carolina is too far north to effectively grow sugar, but they could grow rice and indigo. And so they began growing large amounts of rice and indigo. These became the cash crops of the colony. And of course, this is how they transplanted large Caribbean style plantation slavery directly from the Caribbean to what would become the United States. These early colonists fought a two-year war with the Yamasee tribe in South Carolina and drove out the Yamasee in what was known as the Yamasee War. The northern part of the colony, though, was difficult to access. Communications were difficult. As early as 1691, they appointed a deputy governor for the northern part of the colony, which developed very differently than the southern part of the colony. In fact, the northern part of the colony developed more like Virginia, immediately to the north. 
And in 1712, King George II of England officially separated North Carolina from South Carolina, and they became two colonies. In 1729, the king converted both of the Carolinas into royal colonies, but the founding of the Carolinas is once again how you transport large Caribbean-style plantation slavery from Barbados to what is now the United States. The last of the original 13 colonies to be founded was Georgia. And the idea of Georgia began with James Oglethorpe, who was a member of the English Parliament. Oglethorpe was a believer in the Enlightenment, this intellectual movement that was sweeping across Europe at the time. And one of the beliefs of Enlightenment thinkers was that it was the environment that had a greater impact on the development of a person as opposed to their uh, genetics or their parentage. And so Oglethorpe wanted to found a colony from what he called the worthy poor. Uh, that is the working poor of London who were locked up in debtor's prisons in London. And so King George II of England at the time had no interest in the Enlightenment or in the worthy poor or in emptying out the debtor's prisons. But he was afraid of Spanish expansion. The Spanish colonies in what is now Florida constantly expanded to uh, or threatened to expand north and threatened South Carolina and other English colonies and so he wanted a buffer between the Carolinas and Spanish Florida and so the king uh, gave Oglethorpe a colonial charter in 1733 that same year Oglethorpe helped to found Savannah which became the capital of the colony they named it Georgia after King George II. Oglethorpe in the early founding of the colony also outlawed things like slavery as inconsistent with Enlightenment thinking. Uh, Oglethorpe led troops in, in repelling a Spanish invasion of Georgia in 1742, but then the next year Oglethorpe returned to London in 1743. Meanwhile, in his absence, the settlers began calling for the legalization of African slavery so they could compete with their neighbors in South Carolina economically. And in 1749, uh, the leaders of the colony legalized slavery. Uh, and Rice became the primary cash crop of Georgia, like it was in South Carolina. And Georgia developed very similarly to South Carolina. Uh, Georgia was converted into a royal colony in 1752, uh, but the founding of Georgia completed the founding of the last of the original 13 colonies uh, in what would become the United States. Now, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, I would provide you with a, a chronology of European colonization in what is now the United States, and that is what these next few slides are for all the way from the founding of the first European settlement in what would become the United States when Ponce de Leon founded the Spanish settlement of San Juan in what is now Puerto Rico, uh, all the way into the Stono uprising in South Carolina. But you can see this timeline, don't panic, you don't have to know all of these dates, but this should give you an idea of the order in which things happened the Spanish are founding colonies, the English are founding colonies, the Dutch are founding colonies, the French, and of course even New Sweden as well. And so uh, certainly you should use this as a, uh, a crib sheet, if you will, a, a tool to help you learn the order in which all of these colonies uh, took shape and some of the important events along the way. And so this concludes the lecture.